We're going to review risk management, which is chapter three from your textbook. Just like all previous chapters, you should have read the chapter first and then follow along in your book. So the learning objectives, you should be able to define risk. You should be able to define risk management. You should be able to discuss the meaning and the process for risk identification. You should be able to discuss the meaning of and the process for risk evaluation. And you should be able to discuss the meaning of and the process for risk control. Further, discuss the use of cause and the defect diagram, be able to explain interrupting the accident sequence process, be able to discuss the components of the use of the hat in matrix, be able to differentiate between passive, active, voluntarily, and mandatory risk reduction strategies, and then be able to apply risk control strategies to an injury problem that your department may have. NFPA 1500, which again is our main safety document that we should follow for safety in the fire service, identifies risk as a measure of the probability and the severity of adverse effects that result from an exposure to a hazard. And we have risk management, which includes five components, risk identification, risk evaluation, establishment of priorities for action, risk control in itself, risk management monitoring. And these are all based on Life Safety Initiative 3, as well as NFPA. So risk, we can say risk could be anything bad that could happen to an organization. And when we speak of an organization, what we're really saying is the employees of an organization. Because an organization is only as good as employees. And you, know, you have to be able to determine what bad could happen. And I, I use this picture from a fire that we had and we extinguished the fire in this, I believe it was a four or five story center hallway apartment building. And now you can see we've got water everywhere. Well, here you have a potential for someone to slip and hurt themselves. So the fire hazard in itself has gone away, but we could have someone fall, hit their head and be severely injured even possibly die in something where you would think, oh, the fire hazard's over. But you can see there's firefighters there without a helmet on, which they really should still have a helmet because ceilings can drop down and other things. But this is where something bad could happen after, especially after the fire. And what we have to do is we have to base our risk identification on our local experience. What type of hazards do we expect to have? If it's, if it's a department that isn't by will say a water source and you wouldn't have marine type injuries. But if there's a wildland area there or a wildland interface, then you would expect them to have those type of local problems or local hazards. And we have to base that on, and we have to base this on identifications of trends. And how do we know about trends? You have to be able to read local trade magazines there's several out there for the fire service. Search the internet. Everything's out there nowadays on the internet. And even if you go to YouTube, you'll see all kinds of videos out there of near misses and, and people getting hurt. One that I use for a course that I teach is people that are on ladders that the person walks away when they're supposed to be assisting, supporting the ladder. And you'll see the people fall. And these are all over YouTube. Again, and also, with, you know, you need to attend conferences. You need to get outside your own bubble. You need to make sure that you know what's going on in the fire service. What are the new trends? What are the new hazards? And there's always gonna be something new. And then you can identify those trends. Sometimes you have to do a safety audit of your own department to make sure that, first you gotta do an audit to make sure that you're doing everything appropriately. And then make sure that your, your department's in compliance. Are your apparatus in compliance? Are your stations in compliance? You, know, you need to make sure, you need to have a check sheet so that once you determine that you're in compliance, that you stay in compliance. Now what's really important is you gotta re review your previous injury experience. If you're a fire department that's had 20 back injuries a year and that number's staying constant, then maybe we're doing something wrong. So you need to be prepared to look at that. So frequency, as the slide shows here, it's how often a particular risk is likely to occur. And the severity is, the measurement of how great the loss or the consequences of the loss will be. So you need to be able to evaluate those two. How often is it likely to occur? And then if it does occur, what is the loss? And then there's always cost associated with any kind of risk evaluation, whether it be equipment costs that are broken, whether it be employee costs, including days off or 
severely injured where they can't return to work. And these have a great impact on the organization. So what we have to do is we have to establish priorities for our action. We have to evaluate it. We have to figure out, okay, what is our priorities? Obviously the most severe priorities we need to deal with if they can be prevented. And then we start working our way down. And here's an example of frequency and severity. We look at collisions while responding. The frequencies are low, but the severity can be high. If you have a fire apparatus that's, that's responding on a call and they don't get in accidents that often, but when they do, you have a potential for having three or four personnel that may be severely hurt, may be off the job, might even be killed, and even though it's a low frequency, that's a high severity, and we want to make sure that doesn't happen. Trap during firefighting. Again, a low frequency, but the severity is high. Again, the injuries and or deaths that occur from this. Sprains, strains associated with lifting during medical responses. This frequency is high, especially as the fire service responds on more and more medicals. I don't know of many departments anywhere where their number of medical calls have gone down. Just the opposite. The medical calls the number of them have gone up and the severity here is medium because we always we've always had people injured because we're carrying people down stairs we're carrying people over objects and there is no matter how you try to prevent it there is always a hazard of those sprains and strains that is the number one injury that we see in the fire service nowadays there's three broad categories of risk control their risk avoidance risk reduction and risk transfer. So the first thing we're gonna talk about is risk avoidance. And how can we do that? Well, one choice is not to do the task which your risk is associated. Hopefully we're not doing tasks that we don't need to do and hopefully we're not hurting people on tasks we don't need to do, but maybe there is tasks that we don't need to do. And again, that option is not usually available to emergency response professionals because the calls are all different. Bullet point there says the nature of the profession, that's what part of it is. We need to be careful, we need to watch how we lift, how we move, but it is an emergency response. It's not a predetermined calculation of a call. And as it says there, we're usually called when things have already gone wrong. People don't call us usually prior to something going wrong. They call us as the fire service there to go fix it. There is risk involved in every call that we go on. Risk reduction. You know, how can we reduce the risk of injuries? Again, you know, how do we reduce the risk or minimize the chance that it will occur? We can try to receive input from employees who are affected by this risk. A lot of times is you don't want to, you don't want to always make decisions without full knowledge and all the information you need to make those decisions. And a lot of times it's let's get the people involved that are going on those medical calls or those fire calls. Nowadays, most chiefs don't respond to medicals unless there is a person trapped. And so we need to find out from our employees, can we be doing something different? Can we be doing something that reduces the injury to employees? What we see now is there's new CPR machines out there and again, this is something that was tried years ago, but they were so bulky. But the ones I've seen now is where it's pretty lightweight. We can carry people downstairs without having to try and do CPR. We can use cause and effect diagrams. We can try to interrupt the accident sequence. We can use the Haddam matrix, which we'll talk about these threes in just a little bit. Risk transfer. This should be closely related to the safety and health program. This is where we transfer the risk to another insurance company and it's usually based on previous experience of injuries, including injuries and accidents and other risks. There is several different kinds. Workers' compensation insurance is insurance that covers employees injured while on the job. Every state has a different one, but in the state of California, we have our own. There's management liability, which is often referred to as errors and emissions, covers the actions or lack of the employees who are performing duty on behalf of the employer. General liability is designed to protect the organization from a property loss. And all the coverage varies, protection against theft, fire, storms, and such are usually provided. And then vehicle insurance. Vehicle insurance covers the organization's vehicles from damage or theft. Vehicle insurance policies also protect the insured from liability caused by the vehicle or its operators. Those are the different types of liability. They're all in your book. Some cities, like the city that I work for, they are self-insured and they cover all of these themselves, except for they have 
some type of overhead insurance that if there's a huge dollar amount, then they pay a company to handle that. Next, we have interrupting the accident sequence. Here it shows of classifications of event leading to a back injury. This is directly from your book. There are some causes of back injuries and they're based on previous studies. Location of the equipment on the apparatus. Where is that equipment? Is that equipment placed up high where you gotta reach at an odd angle? Or is it placed at a ground level? And typically you wanna put your equipment that you use more often at a a location that you can get it out easily and not injure people. What is the fitness of the firefighter? Are they a fit firefighter? Do employees want to ask for help for something? You know, muscle strains and overexertion, which you'll see are two of our major injuries we see in the fire service. And there's factors that lead to this. What is the social environment on the department? Is the organization, does it have a climate of that they want a safety climate? They have values and belief based on safety? Does the peer pressure, do the employees all believe that safety is a priority? And we all say safety is a priority, but do we really believe it? This comes down to, does the employee want to ask for help on something that somebody else may not ask for help? And there's a human factor. Is the firefighter fit for the job? And we all assume that you should be, but that's not always the case. And then location of equipment on the apparatus. Is it in a low area or is it on a high area? And then there's the muscle strains and overexertions. It could be either be an accident where something accidentally happens or it could be an injury that they're hurt doing a task at a fire. Now this is the Haddon matrix and it uses 12 different areas to determine the risk. And there's the human area, energy area, physical environment, and the social environment. And there's pre-event, there's event, and there's post-event. So each of those four top ones has, you have a human factor, which has a pre-event, has an event, and a post-event. And so we'll look at this, here's an example. In the human factor, the pre-event, do we train firefighters and company officers to recognize flashover conditions? Do the incident commanders make a risk analysis before committing to interior attacks on the buildings that may not be worth saving? And remember, the incident commander is that first in captain when they arrive on scene. It may not be a chief officer. Do we prepare those people to make those kind of decisions? There's a vent. Have we trained our personnel on survival techniques and how to get out rapidly? Do we have rapid intervention teams or rapid intervention companies, RIT or RIC? Are they ready? Does everybody have a cell phone pass device? And here's an example of which of the following would be the most effective as a risk reduction measure is that all employees wear a cell phone pass device. And what that is, is that when you turn on the air to your breathing apparatus, it automatically turns on your pass device. The first versions of this, you had to manually turn it on and off each time. Now, when you turn your air on, the pass device turns on, and if you run out of air or you become unconscious or immobile, really, then the pass device will start activating. And then post-event, which we hope we never get here, but we have to, is we train our personnel in burn care that if we haven't done a good enough job in pre-event or event, then we need to be able to take care of our people. To pre-events, we could say in, in a certain condition, we don't enter the interior of a structure, which probably isn't reasonable. Unless, again, the employees have been trained to determine flashover conditions and they, and they make that decision. We want to make sure that all of our, during the event, all of our people are wearing full personal protective equipment. They should always be. I can speak personally, that, is, that saved my crew and my life one night when we were caught in a flashover and we, we came out of it with one minor back injury and one minor burn to employees. So again, PPE, it will save your life. It will save you from getting burned. And post event is makes others aware of fire ground or interior conditions. What we need to do is that if the, if there's a danger in the fire ground, we need to make sure that everybody knows it. Physical, separate from cause, you know, use proper hose streams and adequate gallons per minute, follow good tactics, including ventilation, which is really important. If you have crews that do vertical ventilation, then you won't typically have a flashover. And you want to make sure during the event that the captain or the supervisor has an escape route planned and all the employees know it or all the firefighters. You want to make sure that as well as our 
rapid intervention company that we have the ability for EMS at scene for rapid care and transport if something does go wrong. And then the social environment. We have to educate the public to be safer with fire, and we're, we're doing that in the fire service. We have to make sure that all of our personnel, that there is no peer pressure about wearing personal protective equipment, PPE, and self-contained breathing apparatus, because things do go wrong at times, and you want our personnel to be as protective as they can be. During the event, you could make a less aggressive attack, but what I found is if you make a less aggressive attack, things tend to go worse rather than if you get in there and you, as we say, put the wet stuff on the red stuff or put water on the fire. And then we should always have proper follow-up and care and rehabilitation for our personnel. But again, we hope we never get to these on the post event. Control measures. Voluntary, we have passive, which is EMS at the scene for rapid care and transport. And what that means is that, you know, there's nothing that says you have to do that but it's always a good practice. An act of is to use proper hose stream and adequate gallons per minute and have an escape route. Mandatory. This means there should be policies on this that all employees wear a cell phone pass device. Like I said, as most of the new breathing apparatus today have a cell phone pass device, but maybe some departments that reserve breathing apparatus don't. But this should be mandatory. This is a safety thing that we should not it should not be a choice. Employees must wear full personal protective equipment. There shouldn't be a choice. There should be a policy on that. And if it's not done, then actions need to be taken. And this one, this is kind of a tough mandatory in my book, is use proper hose stream and adequate gallons per minute. We hope we always do that. And I don't know why we wouldn't, but the book feels that this should be something that's mandatory but I don't know how you would put that into a policy, but ideally you would use that at all incidents. So summary, risk management is a five-step process. There's a risk identification, risk evaluation, establishment of priorities for action, risk control, risk management monitoring, and then safety and health program management is not subjective. We, we must do it for everybody and it should be a part of our culture and should be a part of our department. And programs have objective components that are foundation for local decision making. All our decision making should be made on our safety programs. And you won't find too many people that if you take them facts and then we could save money by reducing injury that most department, cities, counties will give you the money to save this money and to make it a safer program for the firefighters.